How are you doing today, sir? <laughs> Very well. It's lovely to make your acquaintance in these crazy times. Thank you for having me. Listen, I've been a fan of your work for a very long time. I thank you sincerely for doing this uh, Zoom call, this interview, if you will. Um, uh, you haven't done one of these with us before, but so we start every interview off with a few fun questions before right. we actually get to the reason why we're here. Uh, the first question for you is, what TV series would you love to guest star on? Um, I was going to say, because I'm just sort of going back over stuff right now. I've been watching older stuff, so I'm like, I wish I could say The Sopranos, but I can't, right? No, you, you, you could actually say The Sopranos. It works. Oh, really? Great. <laughs> uh, Sopranos in a heartbeat. <laughs> okay. Um, do you have a favorite ride at Disneyland? Uh, duh. Pirates of the Caribbean. No, Space Man. Space Man. Space Man. There is a certain nostalgic charm to Pirates of the Caribbean as a ride, you know? So... It's 100%. Well, you could also discuss like which version of Pirates you like. The one that used no, to yeah. have the, you know, the un -PC right. version or the newer. Yeah, exactly. There's a, that's a whole world. I feel like that's a trap though. I'm staying well out of that. <laughs> um, what movie do you think you've seen the most? It's somewhere in, in between The Hustler, which was a movie I watched a lot, uh, Taxi Driver, On the Waterfront, um, Last of the Mohicans. I watched a lot of that um for movement for like legolas i remember um yeah sure uh we can get, we can move to the next one which is um have you seen a tv show all the way through more than once no not more than once no i i'm not um i do binge these big shows now um, but I'm not somebody who's binged and just is this obsessively like, I've got to watch that all over again. No. People do that? Oh, for sure. Right. Yeah, for, I can imagine that. Actually. Uh, hardcore. Um, mm. I, obviously, you went to acting school. Um, and you, you went to, I believe, more than one acting school uh, as you were growing up. Um, do you still remember, were, are any of the lessons that you learned in school still things that you sort of take with you? Or do you view that as more of like the foundation that sort of you built upon? Um, both. I mean, for sure it was a foundation that was, for me, very, very necessary. I got the discipline the cro in, in the craft, a respect for the craft of, of my profession and an understanding about being a team player and what it meant to do, to work as a company of actors. Um, and then obviously technique things, which, um, which still, um, percolate and, uh, and come into play when I'm sort of thinking through character and, and, and what I want to, what I want to lean into and so on. You, um, I believe you were in the West end and you've been on Broadway. Yeah. And I'm always curious, do you, can you tell the difference between the audiences when you're in the West end and Broadway? Oh, massively. Yeah. So what can you can you uh, describe what the difference I'm like is? Being, I, mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's sort of like if you went to see a soccer match in England and then you went to see a football match in America or something, you know, it's like, I mean, Americans are just way more like when you come on stage on Broadway, there's like an applause and or a standing ovation. It's like crazy. It's like, oh, my God. You know what I mean? There's like this celebration of the actor. And then um, the West End is, of, is, is just much more reserved. And you're lucky to get a standing ovation, you know, in some, sometimes it's, you really have to earn their, 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 um, their respect and appreciation. Whereas I feel in, in America, it's much more generously given in some ways. Um, um, yeah, it's a sort of cultural thing. I'd say, I guess that would be an interesting thing to, uh, to do a real piece on uh, in some ways. I've brought it up with Kenneth Braun and a bunch of other people who yeah. have worked in both. And I'm always it's the same. They said similar stuff that you really have to work for it in London. Yeah, you have to work for it a lot more, yeah. I did a show two years ago called Killer Joe in London. And it was a really, it's a, an amazing piece of writing by Tracy Letts, um, one of his earlier plays. And it was, um, you know, a really testy time to get that play up and running. Um, but it was, it was, it was potent and... Uh, and I, and I really feel I earned that res the respect of an audience for our, our standing ovations. We, we were 
it was a small theater of the tricycle, not the tricycle, sorry, the Trafalgar Studios, and which is a great space to work in. But it was one of those ones where like, in the interval, everyone was dead silent. Like we had, like you could hear a pin drop because I think people were so shocked because it, it, go, it goes into this really intense moment. And then it's like, <sighs> and then they came back. And at the end, it was like, people were just on their feet, which was sort of awesome, you know? And you really feel you earned it there. And I, I mean, and in New York, it was always like every show was just like, a, it was almost like, wow, you know, it was a really wonderful feeling, I mean, you know? But it didn't feel like, it just felt like that was what they did, you know? Well, but maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. Well, what, what you actually don't know and what Tracy told me is that he actually gave everyone five pounds in the audience. <laughs> He yeah. felt really bad for you, and that's why the standing ovation happened. Oh, good. Yeah, I believe it. <laughs> yeah. Um, that jump, joke's already been around my head already, and the theater, by the way. <laughs> jumping, uh, I want to start with uh, jumping into why I get to talk to you today. I want to talk to you about The Outpost. Um, okay. I'm a big fan of Rod's work, and I really yeah. think that he did a great job with the film, especially because this was not made on some huge budget. So how did you first get involved in the project? Jake Tapper had written this amazing story of these young heroes um you know and whatever you want to say about whether america should be at war with this person or the other person the guys who are on the ground there the boots on the ground are you know for love of country for love of their the fellow man for love of the people they're they're in the intention with which they're doing what they're doing is 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 really heroic and sort of unquestionable in my mind unshakable you know i mean i i at least that's how i felt you know when i certainly and, and explored it more and i sat down with rod who you know is a west point man who um and, I, and it was just very apparent he was very vulnerable about where he was at in his career with um as a director and what he wanted to achieve with this film and what it meant to him um and I just was like, I'll, I'll work, I'll go to work with you. You know, I'll definitely, you know, and, and, uh, Keating, <clears throat> the character thing, who I, I, I spoke to his family, I spoke to his father actually. And I, I had this, um, very, uh, like an almost eerie connection to who he was and, you know, and I had this sense that he was somehow around me or with me. It was a very unusual feeling, but I wanted to do, I definitely wanted to do justice um, to that role and to his life. And, um, and he was, you know, a really phenomenal leader of, of men in the sense that he was, uh, you know, he was, there wasn't, um, he was, he was a man of his, of his word, but he was, he was one of his men. He wasn't standing above. He was like, he was very, he was known for his, um, his leadership and taking, and there was, there was nothing that he wouldn't do himself. He would never send a man to do something that he couldn't do himself or wouldn't do himself. If you see what I'm saying. So it was, um, after talking to Rod, I just was like, yeah, I can see, you know, uh, for the first act of this movie, he's sort of the heart, he's the center. He's sort of, you know, you, he sets the tone for what this um, journey they're about to embark on is. And I was um, really happy. And I, I remember there's just, there's a host of talented talent in that movie. And some names you'll recognize, some you won't, and some you'll certainly know of moving forward because they were all phenomenal. And I went to the set on like my last day and was just like checking, like sort of saying my farewells, but looking around and just observing. And I thought, yeah, yeah, this is going to be an honest but strong movie, and and that's what it is. It's it, it you know it's not pretend. There's no pretense or pretentiousness to it. It's just it's just a great, solid, honest performance. And I think Rod really really brought one home there. Oh, a hundred percent. One of the things that I found was uh, I I don't want to spoil anything for people that have not seen the film. Um, I did not know that much going into the into watching it, and it really surprised me certain things in the film. And I think you being in it was a real, shit, it's hard to talk about um, without, but let's just yeah. say that um, yeah, things happen in the film that you're not expecting. And yeah. Because it's you and someone that people recognize as things happen, like it's very unexpected certain yeah. things happen. And yeah. I, I think that you added a lot by being in it. Yeah. Well, thank you. No, I mean, it was, 
it was easy. Um, it was important to me. And, um, like I said, and, and, uh, and I think you're right. I think it helped and, uh, it, 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 it worked out well for, for both the film and, and, and I was, yeah, like I was very, very, uh, I'm very proud of the film, I think. And, and, and what Rod did, and like I said, all the other guys, I think they really kind of brought one home there. Yeah. For people that, um, don't know, um, that much about the outpost it's now streaming on vod people yeah. can, can rent it right now it is so well done and it's not um as you said there's no like pretense to it it's not overly directed it's just no. a very raw and honest portrayal of this true story yes exactly yeah it doesn't pull any punches but it but it's hot centered and uh and it, I, I think it's um at a time like this, I think it's an important movie, honestly, for, for, the, for a country, you know, for this country that is, you know, going through such remarkably huge, necessary, important changes, um, which at some times you lose, lose sight of, of some of the heroes that, you know, are um, important to the tapestry of this country. Um, so it's, it's, it's a good one. A hundred percent. Jumping into the, man, I have a lot of things to talk about with you, but we're going to jump into retaliation now. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which is, you, you made, this is one of those projects. Okay, so let's start at the beginning since not a lot of people are going to be familiar with it. And no. I hate asking the generic question or the generic thing, but can you sort of talk about what the film is about and who you play? Yeah, so I play um, Malky. He is um, he's a young man. He works in demolition. We meet Malky. He's uh, demolishing a church and um, he works with a crew of guys. And um, the story is really about um, abuse. Um, Malky is a young man who has suffered at the hands of um, an abuser in his life. Um, and after decades, this, 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 man reappears in his life and it kind of triggers um, a spiral into um, what can only be described as um, um, a destroyed view of self and the world and the fear, anger and frustration that, 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 that he has, has lived with manifests in his life and he looks to get revenge and, 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 uh, and, and, uh, um, find a healing somehow. And, and it's really, um, a comment on the masculine and, and, and men. I actually spoke to an organization called one in six and some others and sent the script before I, 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 I read the first three pages and I knew I wanted to do it. I spoke to Jeff, the writer, Thompson, and, and I knew it was loosely based on his story, but I just, I just felt um, very um, moved by the writing and the truth and the vulnerability within it and who Jeff was. And one in six, who's the, this organization, because one in six men have been abused. They were, they were like, please make this movie, please. You don't understand how important this will be for men in the world. Some who have um, suffered from abuse, sexual abuse, and how, how, um, how, how frequent that happens. And, and yet, because men are men, they don't talk about their feelings or emotions. And so many of them are just carrying this burden. And you know, what we see in Malky is what happens when you have a man who is unhealed, who hasn't, um, who hasn't processed um, uh, the experience uh, that he lived through, that he, um, um, and, 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 and the damage that that does, and, and, what, and what the impact is on his, his life, his relationships, um, his personal relationships, his, you know, the, the way that he sees himself, um, and there was, um, you know, a lot of incredibly challenging <clears throat> moments. And I think the film is, um, is a very honest and again, uncompromising look at a character. And, uh, I was just, uh, you know, I was ready to roll up my sleeves and do whatever it took to, um, to, to try and bring something that, that I felt would um, enable other men to watch and hopefully 
not feel so alone and not feel so, lo- you know, not and, and understand that there are, there, that it is a real thing for people and that they, they can get help or, and I hoped that, you know, that, that would, it would lead people to, to that, you know, a healing. I thought your performance was fantastic. And, uh, and it, it was raw and it felt emotional and it just, um, I thought you did just a, a fantastic job in the role. It, it also, one of the things about this film is that it is, it could not have been easy to get made because this is not subject matter that studios are like clamoring to tell the story. So can you sort of talk about, I mean, were you moving lights on set? Was it one of these kind of real indie? It real really, kind of yeah, thing? it really was. Um, it was a true labor of love. And of course, yeah, there was, you know, it was, it was done on a shoestring. Everybody was there because they believed in the story and the writing and they wanted, they committed, um, you know, the directors, these two brothers, Paul and Ludwig, and they <clears throat> very new to the world, but real sincerity, uh, real, uh, passion for, um, for the writing, their friends are the writers. And, um, you know, they were very, um, uh, sincere and, uh, and, and and true in what they wanted it wasn't but it was it was very it was very um um it was it was very uh what's the i'm trying to think of how to it's 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 uncompromising and it's not showy it's not it's really just it's unfolding it's presenting they really just presented this this world these characters and this story and yeah it was it was you know i mean i was i remember being on set and i was i was so immersed in malky that if i walked onto the location and there was something not right i i i just said i just told them i said look i remember this like it happened on a couple of occasions actually there was this pub where a lot of stuff took place and we initially had this scene and there was like this Irish band playing in the corner, which happens at times in, in pubs, which are pubs being, you know, bars in America drinking, you know. Um, but I knew in my mind that this was like what this pub was. It was like a place where these kind of guys who've gone to work, come home, get a drink and probably get in a fight and then go home to their misses and you know what I mean and then get up and start their day again and I didn't and there was this sort of feeling of like there was like it was as if it was like supposed to be a bit more um well to do in somehow and I was like this doesn't feel right in my you know it was one of those conversations and we managed to you know we had a great honest conversation about what what and, and that was a kind of a good starting point I was actually in the first couple of days of filming and we actually um addressed that and I'm grateful to the to the finances and, and the people in, who the producers as well because they they sort of took that on board and they saw a little bit more of what we what 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 the vision for the my vision for Malky was and therefore part of what the vision for the world was and and it was a it was a great conversation because these guys you know Paul and and Ludwig um as I said they were they were new newer to direction but really had this you know, um, beautiful connection with the writer and wanted to honor the story. So we kind of had this great collaboration with that. Um, and it was true to of, of a sequence at the end. You've seen the film, right? So you've seen, so the, at the end with my mother that I walked into this house and it was like, there was, um, you know, um, there were all these photographs of Malky all over the place. And I said, that doesn't feel right. Like she's not, she doesn't, Malky is like not she's not ador- he's not she doesn't put him on a pedestal you know what I mean there was like she wouldn't have like it's like I was just we and so we had we had those kinds of so yeah it was like uh let's take these down and let's just you know what I mean simplify and modify and it was it was it was the first time um in a way in my career that um you know I had a, I've had a lot of experience and and I was working um, you know, with a lot of people who had, you know, just all the sincerity in the world to get the right thing done. And we collaborated so well together and we were, we had an open dialogue. So it felt, it felt like a team, a team effort. Um, and, uh, you know, and I was just very committed to the character in the world with such, um, passion. I just, you know, it was, important to me that 
everything resonated with uh, real authenticity and, and truth to the story and to Malky. No, 100%. When, when you're playing a character like Malky, who it's, there's a lot going on behind the scenes, you know, of, of a character like this and a lot going on in his head, are you able to leave the character, you know, it's the end of the day, you've done, sh- you're done shooting, can you leave Malky on set? Or, or when you're playing a role with this kind of depth um, and, and commitment, uh, is it sort of, is he with you the entire shoot? Yeah, I would say I couldn't really shake him for four, at least four or six weeks after as well. He was really, he, he was really on my back and in me. Um, um, yeah, I have a pit in my stomach when I think about it, to be honest, because there were things that were asked of me in that film that, you know, there's a, there's a very graphic, violent scene of, um, you know, I think you'll remember up when I'm, I got, I'm looking at the mirror and, and, and Malcolm is reclaiming his, he's reclaiming his, um, the abuse. So, so there's a scene with a, where Malky takes a cudgel, which is a, a martial arts, um, a martial arts uh, weapon. Um, actually, Jeff's story was 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 similar to Malky's, although he was, um, I think, um, he's publicly written about this, so I can honor his his story and and say it was it was he framed it differently in the fact that he wanted to make this about a priest, but um, a cudgel, which is a martial art weapon, was is relevant to to to, to Jeff because that was what he had used and 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 there's this scene where Malky takes this this instrument which is is like a you know um and 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 he and he penetrates himself and and he's it's a really painful moment where you see a a man taking back something that was taken from him and I said to Jeff I was like look so this is really brutal um I can you know and I'm, I'm really trying to understand how to play the truth of this moment. And we went into this scene and the, and the directors had an idea and of how they, they wanted me to sit and be. And I said, oh, I think he's, I think he's got to stand and I think he's got to look himself in the eye and I think he's got to take, and I think he wants to like, and Jeff had said to, and I said, so is this just like the most painful, awful experience, you know, like, cause to me, it just, it just feels like that would just be. And he said, no, <laughs> he was like, he said, actually, Orlando, there is a degree of pleasure because it was my first sexual encounter. It was not, you know, I didn't know what was happening to me and it was something that was being taken from me and assist this. Or, but it, so there's this plethora and this pain and this multitude of things going on inside him. Um, and just, you know, trying to find um, the truth of that moment was really, um, really challenging and, again, you know, but we, we managed to find it where it was like, cause I wanted Malky to own that time, own every, he owned everything in his environment. He was, he's physical and he's done, he's a, he's a works in demolition. Everything is, you know, so it was, um, it was interesting to, again, to sort of work with the directors and go, look, I think if we, if you really, you can, you can get in there and see what that, what that, what that would mean. And, and talking to Jeff, who, who, who actually happened to be around, he very sensitively came to the set on that occasion and he was um, able to, to sort of help me, guide me through a little bit what that experience was for him. And I think that, you know, that's something that there is so sh- much shame, so much shame and guilt for men in the world, um, you know, because it's, it's something that is true for many men. They, they take, it's not something that they necessarily take pleasure from, but it's a way of reclaiming a moment that was taken from them at a very young age. And it's, it's, um, you know, so it's, it's the subject matter is really obviously very, very challenging. And, um, and the movie is very uncompromising in the way it's presented. So I never thought this movie was going to see the light of day. I mean, aside from how, you know, aside from how, aside from how punchy it is <laughs> for want of a better word, you know, um, there was complications on the release and how it was going to release. And, and it were, and I remember at one point I just threw my arms up and I was like, I can't believe I've just uh, done all this work on this. And it's, you know, I don't know what's going to happen to it. And actually it was three years ago. So, you know, and it was funny because a couple of weeks ago now I sort of knew that it had been picked up and was going to get some kind of a release. 
And I started getting these texts and these emails from people in my life. And they were like, have you seen these? Have you seen what people are saying about this movie and about your work in this movie? And I was like, no, send it to me. <laughs> and, uh, and it was just great. I mean, I mean, when I say that, I just, if, if, if people get to, you know, if there are men out there that get to who find this film and, and like I said, can get something from it and hopefully a healing, then, um, then it's all been worth it, you know? And it was just amazing that, I mean, even talking about it now, quite frankly, I just like, you know, like I didn't think it would be a conversation really. I just, I was like, I'd resided myself to it. You know, there was some small release in different countries, but I just, you know, I was like, and I was always like, well, what do I need to do? How do we bang the drum on this one? How do we really give it a, you know? Sure. So. Look, I mean, uh, I'm not gonna, like, listen, I talk to a lot of people and uh, you don't know this about me, but I, I don't bullshit people on camera. If, uh, if I don't like something, I just won't mention it. Cool, cool. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but yeah. I, I'll say on camera to you, your performance is fucking good. And oh. it, it's very powerful. And I also think that it is, like, there's a lot of, there had to have been a lot of responsibility for you because you, there are gonna be people who've gone through what you are depicting on screen, who are gonna watch this and feel like, because not many films are made that address with this kind of sincerity and honesty, what you guys are trying to tackle. And yes. the responsibility of playing someone that's gone through that has to be very immense. That's right. And I really, I, that, you landed it. And I rambled because I'm, I guess naturally, uh, obviously, slightly uncomfortable talking about some of the stuff that was required in this film of me, but um, but it was a really way of it was a true sense of responsibility that I felt to 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 the countless men out there that have been through these kinds of experiences, which is just so horrific. And then you know, and then you wonder why there are people living on the street, um, why there are people who are having, you know, these explosive breakdowns or, you know, or, you know, the, the, you know, uh, re, uh, violent, the, having violence in their life and, and stuff. And, and, you know, there's, you can always trace it back. Things always trace back to something, to something that's happened from, from childhood, you know, um, because we come into this world as these sort of clean beings and it's all about, nature and nurture and conditioning right as to who you become and the lack of and you see in this relationship with Malky's mother for example played so beautifully um by um Annie Reed who you know um just the subtlety of her performance the looks this like this like slight shortness of breath she had this and and this tone um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Harold Pinter, the writer, but I, um, yeah, I, 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 I sort of almost saw the relationship between Malky and his mum very as a very Pinteresque kind of thing, you know, like that. Not like everything that's being said is not being said, and the vulnerability um, that he feels, the powerlessness that he feels around his mother, the feelings of you know, and, and what that does to a man, you know, like that shame and, 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 and uh, being misunderstood to such a huge degree. And, um, you know, so much so that she's, you know, this priest who's taken this from him is she, she would, she would take his word over, you know, take that guy's word. So I want to talk about the third act of this movie so bad. Yeah. But for people that have not seen it, it I, I can't do it. Oh, to be honest, I hope people get to see it, but I'm happy to talk about it because I don't know how people are going to get to see it, quite frankly. <laughs> no, 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 because I do think that people who watch this are going to be more right. inclined to, to give it a shot. But the, right. the thing about your character is that there is a lot that, fuck, the, the third act has a lot that comes out and it illuminates so much of your portrayal in the first two acts of the film that you know, the third act reveals so much. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I have to ask, so for people that are watching this that are like retaliation, I haven't heard of this. Is yeah. it, and I don't know, is it available? Like, how is it available? Yeah, yeah it's streaming online. I think it's still on my Instagram feed, actually. So if you click, it's like I've got it. I've still got it up there because I'm like, uh, until it gets replaced with something for UNICEF or somebody else. But like, sure. at the moment, it's still up there. It's on, I think it's, you can get it on Amazon, I think. Um, 
um, and it's uh, streaming there. Um, yeah, it's a, it's 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 a it's a it's a good one. It's not yeah. a, it's not a light evening date movie necessarily. Well, listen, but it's, I I was going to say I I listen. There's other things we're going to talk about, but for the for everyone watching right now, if you want to see a fantastic performance by the guy you're watching, uh, who I'm talking to, rent the movie. And also, you'd be supporting uh, like real indie cinema. Yeah, it is. It truly is. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was. It, it's. It's. Uh, it needs all that love um, because it was. It was really. Uh, it was made with all that love. You know, and when when you make films like that, you're, ne you're definitely not doing it for money. <laughs> you're not doing it for that. You know, it's. Um, so it was a goodie. Yeah. Um, I want to jump into. Uh, I, I have a few other subjects. Obviously, I want to talk to you about. I, I think that Kingdom of Heaven was the, the director's cut. Yeah. of Kingdom of Heaven was my favorite film of that year. That wow. it's, it's one of Ridley Scott's best film, uh, oh. best films. It's a masterpiece. I can't say enough about it. Thank and I so feel much. like, pardon the language, you guys got fucked with that theatrical release. Oh, don't Just, even get started. Yeah, well, I actually do want to talk a little bit about it. So for you, because for anyone who hasn't seen Kingdom of Heaven or if you've seen the theatrical cut, for the love of God, Get yeah. the, the, the director's cut and watch it. There's an additional 50 minutes yeah. and it completely changes the movie. It's true. It's, it's amazing. It's, it, yeah, it's a, it's, a really, it's a really odd one. And, I, and Ridley is, um, is you, know, you know, a friend and, 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 and somebody who I look up to and will always look up to. And, you know, we did, I was fortunate to work with him not only on Kingdom, but we started on Black Hawk Down. And, you know... I think, you know, for, for the longest time, you know, uh, Bill Monaghan, the writer, and I would have a, uh, a drink after, because we actually lived quite close to each other. It was funny. And we would talk about, and he would always say, oh, Ridley's always talking about how much he wishes he just, the director's cut had been the release of the movie. And I think at the time, you know, I, you know, remember watching, um, the, the 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 theatrical release uh the day before i had to go and do press for the movie um and i was just stumped i was um i just my head went into okay um what how am i gonna how am i gonna what, how do i make this work how do i sell this in a way you know what, I mean? what am i gonna say to people sure because because whilst obviously you know, you, I can, I could, you know, Ridley can shoot, you know, a field and it's like, still there's something interesting to watch. Do you know what I mean? He's sort of like painting a canvas. He uses a camera, but it's, you know, it's a remarkable thing. So, but, but there was a lot that I think the heart of the movie had been, had, had kind of gone in it and, and it was apparent to, to the press because they were coming in going wait it feels truncated it feels sort of what is something's not quite and it's odd because in some ways whilst the director's cut is maybe 30 minutes longer it feels like a much shorter movie because it flows in a way it's actually it's, actually, it's actually 50 minutes longer right it, exactly it is fantastic so to find a light yeah so so it was really it was really interesting um you know, I think I was, I was 27 when I got cast in that movie. And I was, and I, I would say that it was probably arguably written with, um, with Russell Crowe in mind, if I was, if I'm honest, you know, probably. Um, and I auditioned and screen tested and they put armor on me and I had the beard and blood and they did the whole, you know, and I remember running lines with my then girlfriend uh, at the time until five and four in the morning and having like three hours sleep and then going into the screen test. And I'd just done um, Paris and Troy and I was reading Kingdom on the Plane. I was like, oh, this is what I need because Paris was such a, um, such a painfully um, sort of, you know, um, how do we describe, you know, like painfully trite sort of awkward, you know, boyish, you know, like weak sort of, it, it was hard to portray, you know, a boy who is so broken, right. In some ways. And yet, and, and kingdom was this like, you know, earnest, real he sort of, sort of hero role. And I was like, God, oh, this would be amazing to get to do as a juxtaposition. Right. You know, and, um, you know, and it, and it, and it, and it, and it did swing in my favor. I mean, I was obviously, I was sort of, 
piping hot right there and my career was sort of just at that apex and so you know the timing was so good and it was I mean, I've never seen, you know, I mean, I've worked with some pretty phenomenal directors, Peter Jackson, you know, Gore Babinski, of course, and Ridley was, um, and, you know, Wolfgang in Troy was, you know, was interesting. I mean, so many, um, Cameron Crowe, but like, Ridley, like, I've never, like, he just inspires in, in, a, in, in this insane way. And it's, it's true of all of them. I mean, and so, I mean, Pete certainly and all of them. And, but like, I remember we'd be like, one side of the desert and the sun would be going down and you've got 15 minutes and there's like 300 crew and he's and, and he's like let's get that sunset and like you see this whole crew like cross this desert to get a shot that would be and the light and everything it was just it was exquisite it was it was it was that's why um, he's Ridley Scott yeah that's why he's Ridley Scott and I remember working six days a week and everything was a false call and no, there was no question about whether I was going to show up but it was just but it was really, uh, and every moment was a moment. It was not like, there was no like, you know, there's nothing in between. It's like, there's no, there's no light days, dialogue or no, or whatever. It was no light days. So it was, it was certainly um, like a, 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 you know, a huge um, and, 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 and one of the most valuable kind of memories that I cherish, you know, um, from that time, you know, uh, my, that was my first leading role as well, really, which is you did a great job in the movie. And I think that it's one of these situations that, I mean, I've spoken to Ridley about this, um, about what happened. And he said, you know, he listened to the test screening audiences and he listened to the studio and he didn't listen to his gut. And it's one of these things that he's learned from. Yeah. But I really think that if the director's cut, because you look at the reviews of the director's cut and they're uniformly like, if, you know, they're effusive because the movie's amazing. You know, and um, I think when you look back now or the, when you look back on your career with all the things, sorry for rambling, but when you look yeah. back on everything you've done, that film, the extended cut is going to be something that will be with you the rest of your life. For sure. And, I, and nope. it is. It's always like it's the one that I go, you know, I think back and I was so young, um, you know, and relatively inexperienced. I mean, uh, of course, I've been on huge sets. So I was familiar and sort of almost comfortable with that size of a movie set. I understood what it meant to be a part of such a big canvas, which is not true for everybody. Um, but I was relatively inexperienced and didn't have the necessarily all the, the film experience that some would, you know, I mean, when I'm talking, what I'm talking about rather is the amount of films that I've done. I look at some of my peers who've been, you know, performing since they were kids, right? And making tons and tons of growing up on movie sets. I came out of drama school when I was 20, 20. And, you know, I, admittedly, I went straight into, to, um, into, into Lord of the Rings, which was exquisite uh, education in film, uh, working with Peter Jackson, but working with Ian McKellen, Ian Holm. Christopher Lee, Viggo Mortensen, Elijah Wood, you know, like Lee Liv Tyler, these Kate Blanchett, Hugo Weaving. I mean, it's like a who's Sean Bean. It's like a who's who of, of, of talent. And that education in itself was massive. But I remember like, you know, it was, it was kingdom was like, I was ready, but it was, it was a, it was a, it was a bigger, it was a big beast to, well, well, what, big enchilada to jump off. I was just going to say that a lot of people don't realize the difference between being the number one on the call sheet and being number six. Yeah. You know, there was every day, all day, every day. Uh, yeah. There was never a rest. There was no respite. I literally it was mostly six days a week. And also it was, you know, a time where like I was very, very visible. So, you know, it was, I remember I'd be in this hotel in Spain and I was on the phone to my girlfriend at the time and, she said, what's that noise? And I said, oh, that's just these girls. They're just screaming outside the hotel room. And for like 24 hours, it was crazy. They were like, you know, um, it, was, it, was really, it was really unusual. It was, it was a lot, you know. Um, Do you, I, I, got, I, I have to ask, because obviously I'll never experience that. And most people will never experience that. But do you, is it nice to not be like in the limelight like that? Because I can't imagine what it's like to not be able to go to this, even now though, but like to not be able to go to the supermarket. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it was, it was an unusual time, man. I don't think, um, there's nothing that can prepare you for any of that. Um, it was unexpected. 
you know, I, I know, I mean, I know I'd, I'd done all of this press and I've been in these, you know, two trilogies of movies. So, you know, and I was in the middle of one. I mean, I think uh, I did Kingdom and then Elizabeth Town and I think I did Pirates 2 and 3. I can't quite remember, but I, I, I don't remember. Me either. So there you go. This, it, the whole time was a blur. <laughs> like, no, there's no reason why you should remember. But yeah. for me, the whole, <laughs> you're like, the well, whole I'm usually, I'm usually good with these dates with movies. Right. My thing. No. But that, there, there was a there was a few year period where you were making a lot of movies. Yeah, and that whole period was just a blur. Dude. I just was either on set or I was promoting a movie, and I was, uh, you know, I was I was sitting in front of in dark rooms, kind of like you are now, talking to press and about performance and movies and feeling very self conscious and uh, not, you know, and just and just wanting to go back to set and. And, 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 and build my craft and stuff. And, you know, so it's, it's interesting, um, you know, to talk about a movie like Retaliation because it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a game changer for me in terms of the experience and what I wanted to do up post that, you know? Yeah, but I, I also don't think that Retaliation is possible without all the work you've done before because sure. it's allowed you to I mean, maybe become more comfortable in your skin and be able to sort of go for it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You know, I, everything, I, everything, everything, a, a lot of what I was, I guess what I'm saying is even with like Kingdom of Heaven, which I'm so proud of, but it was, it, there was such a big magnifying glass on that, on me, in that, in the sense that I would have been a part of such, and it was a big movie. It was a big tempo movie for the studio and they've got a lot riding on it and it's Ridley Scott and there's a, you know, and, you know, and I'm, and I'm, you know, uh, there's a lot of heat on me. So every, there was a lot of pressure and it's been, and so, so like, I guess it's interesting because in a way to have, to have had like a moment to breathe and then to come back to being able to go into a movie like Retaliation and just sort of get that done uh, and be a part of something like that and not have, not as visible in that way. There's something really, the irony is, is phenomenal, but like the fact that I didn't even think it was going to see the light of day, you know what I mean? And now it's like, and, and now it's like, it's people are saying it's probably some of the best work I've ever done. So it's like, oh, cool. You know, it's like, I, I felt that at the time, you know, but like, and I was like, it was the weirdest thing. Like, oh, I've just given blood, sweat, and tears to this and I don't even think anyone's going to see it. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, I mean, but it's, uh, yes, people are definitely going to see even it. Even released now, you know, in yeah. a COVID period where there's no premiere, there's no, red carpet, there's no fanfare. It's just, if you can guys, click on the link in Amazon and see Retaliation, you know what I mean? It's one of those. Um, which I think is actually weirdly very honoring of at least it's how we're talking about it, so. Yeah, I have to, I have to bring up, I loved your episode of Extras. Like, <laughs> and, and by the way, I think everyone who saw that episode loved that episode of Extras. So I, I know it's a long time ago, but yeah. the thing that I loved about it is that you were really willing to just have fun with it and yeah. play this exaggerated version and just, so. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, that's really Ricky and uh, Ricky Gervais and, and, and Stephen and huge fans of both of them. In, 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 and, and at the time, you know, hot off of The Office and, and everything else, there was, there was a real like buzz around that show, Extras. And I remember meeting uh, both uh, Stephen and, and Ricky in Soho and I was wearing this long coat and this hat and like, uh, cause it was at that time where like I couldn't go anywhere. So I was really high, high like I would keep my eyes to the ground and I, and I would try and disguise. And, 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 and I think Ricky said, what, what have you come as? Sooty, you're sweet. Cause I looked like like a chimney sweep or something. He was just taking a piss. I was like, I was like, oh, uh, uh, yeah, that's me. Um, but at the time, they'd had this sort of um, idea, and it was it was really cool. And I said, don't we want to go further? Don't we want to push it further? Don't we want to really go into like? I mean, I've just done these two trilogies of movies. There's a lot of stuff we can take. I mean, Johnny's like ripe for this stuff, and he's got an, a, he had a Johnny has a wicked British sense of humour about him too. So I knew he'd be kind of cool with it. So you know, and actually I ran it by him as an idea and he was like, yeah, go, go, go to town. But it was, it was definitely like, um, it was like, you know, the whole ego of like, you know, you know, that, that, uh, well, it's all in there, but it's, it's funny. It was, it was really funny to play, but I, I was really nervous. I remember being really nervous because it wasn't comedy, like, um, was not something I was 
had done, used to doing, or even feel like I'm necessarily adept, adept to. But they, I remember Ricky and, and Steve, they were both super um, at directing that, me, and in that they helped an awful lot um, for me to kind of go to that, like, really, you know, it's like that that character into that character of that sort of alter ego narcissistic but some weird ass narcissistic version of myself which i'm sure people probably thought oh that's him <laughs> you know what i mean like because i remember at the time it was like you couldn't open a magazine without me being the hot something or other you know that's why it's so good because the episode plays all that into it yeah 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 so but it was yes yeah, it's it's, it's a, it was a it was it was a fun it was a fun one do you remember how many takes were ruined from people laughing uh, uh, about some of the stuff you guys were saying? Steven, I mean, uh, Ricky just laughs out loud. On stage. <laughs> He's like that. He literally is like... Um, He's told know. me he ruined some of the best takes from his life. No, I don't know about that, but he, he is like, he does like go for it. He does. So... But yeah, no, I think I think it was it was very funny, and uh, Stephen was very sensitive to it all as well. They they were they were a good directing duo. I remember on that. Yeah, I um I, I have a few other things I wanted to bring up. Do you have an honorary passport to New Zealand? I hope so. Um, nothing official, but I've always felt that um, I probably should have got something official back in the day, and we probably could have done quite easily because. I've always felt um, an, ama an amazing affiliation because of the amount of time and the lengths and breadths we went to to make those films and, and the places that we went to and, and what it did for the country and what Pete did to bring that world to the life and, 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 and what it did. It was, so I've always sort of, you know, secretly, and of course now in New Zealand, it's COVID free. I mean, people are filming there you know you have to go in and quarantine but then you're safe as houses and it's like yeah i always knew like if there was stuff was going to go down you want to be in new zealand and of course that's the case but life and circumstances leave you in different directions but it's it's a it's a special place so i would love to i would love to have residency there at some point you know but i don't think they're allowing that anymore I was going to say, I'll cut this out of the interview. Um, you know, Orlando wants to have residency in New Zealand, and I'm sure there'll be some sort of, I'm joking, but, you know, the citizens oh, there. Will be no, leave that in. I want it. Yeah, for sure. Listen, I think New Zealand, I've been there a few times. It's amazing. Yeah. Just amazing. So, um, obviously, I think the Lord of the Rings, the original trilogy are, you know, they're amazing. Um, I, I've always been curious, though, and I hope you don't mind me asking, um, you guys originally shot... Before the first one came out, you were shooting the whole trilogy. And then obviously the first one comes out, becomes this massive hit. And then you're doing the additional photography after to, you know, add stuff to plus it, if you will, for the next two movies. I've always wanted to know, did you shoot a lot of the second and third movies before the first one came out? And, were, and was that footage just all like sort of redone because of the success? Uh, that's a good question. Pete sort of shoots these sh shoots like a movie three times, if you like, uh, which is what a lot of people. But but he goes back to reshoot and really like he needed to do that to fill the, the, those those missing pieces out, I think, and to clarify certain things. It was such a huge undertaking, you know. Um, and he was very clever about how he shot. You know, he got the studio completely pregnant with, okay, we'll shoot some of the third movie and some. Because it's like, okay, well, we built the sets for the third movie and you got to shoot that. You know what I mean? Because honestly, I think I think he was probably thinking anyone's going to pull the plug on me any day now. You know what I mean? Like, how are we going to get this done so, in some ways? Because it was the first of its kind. And it was like a giant, almost felt like a giant student movie. I mean, it, honestly, in terms of the experience, um, such belief and love for it. But yeah, like, I think I was actually, they went back and after like... After principal photography, I think they went back and filmed maybe another, I don't even know, I, I, I feel like I want to say eight months, but that could be crazy. But I know it was like a couple of months, maybe. Yeah, eight months is too much, because it was, it was 18 months. I was there for 18 months. And then I think they went back and shot like a couple of months and people came in and out. I actually was already off on, on, um, on, on, you know, other, I, was, I, I was working, so I don't recall going back to do much for pickups. 
uh, for Lord of the Rings, but I do for The Hobbit. I went back for The Hobbit to do some stuff, but um, but yeah, no, it was it was a, it was a huge undertaking doing the uh, the pickups. I mean, they were there for months. It was no there. completely. They were profitable on the first movie alone for the entire trilogy. Yeah, but we'd shot we'd shot the entire trilogy. I mean, it was the pickups were not because the movie had done super. I mean, the pickups happened. There was a fair amount of pickups that happened before the first movie was released also. It wasn't like, you know what I mean? It wasn't just on the success of the first movie, but yes, for sure, the success of the first movie gave them confidence to spend more money and, 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 and flesh it out more. I mean, when you think that there's three movies and a, what, 11 Oscars in there, yeah. you, know, it, you know, it's a pretty, you know, they really, you know, they really went to town to make it, you know, great. And, um, I mean, it was, it was a, that was a certainly, a, it was a certain, that was a time in my life. Actually, I was on the set of Kingdom of Heaven when that, when it sweeped the Oscars that year and I was gutted I didn't go. I was on set shooting and uh, I think there was a conversation about me going, but it was like I, would have had, I was flying from Morocco where I was filming and I was so in it on Kingdom of Heaven. And, uh, and I think I just felt also like, a lot of like, you know, young actor, like, oh, I'm not going to awards ceremonies. What a, I haven't earned, you know what I mean? That thing of sort of, do you know what I mean? That thing of like, but, um, but looking back, I'm, you know, it was, it was, it was amazing to see it from, from the, to watch from the TV, but to have been there with all my, you know, cast would have been really special, but you know, I, I got to celebrate in other ways, but yeah. Well, you were also in the movies. So, I mean, you know, yeah, of course. Exactly. Those, those are going to, you know, uh, live forever. Um, it's funny now that we're talking about it in this COVID time, though, because you go, well, what's going to happen with these things? Like, are we going to, are we out? When, how are they going to make the Oscars work in the or whenever that ever happens? And, and do they even want it to? Should it? Who knows? Everything's suddenly up for grabs, right? It's like, what is the focus these days? Um, other than, you know, if it isn't, the real things of family and friendship and, 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 and doing great work that you can, but it's just really an interesting time, isn't it? So in hindsight, you look back and you go, oh, it would have been fun to have been there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, would, that, that would have been a hell of a fucking party. Yeah, exactly, yeah. You know, um, obviously Amazon, which you're working with uh, right now, yeah. on, um, is doing a Lord of the Rings show. Yeah. Do you watch that from afar and sort of pay attention to it, or do you actually just want to watch this one as a actually, fan? Um, it, do I what? Or do you just want to watch it as like a fan? Oh yeah, I mean, to be honest, it's funny because I'm uh, uh, one of the producers on that um, is I'm, I'm working with quite closely on a few different projects that I'm developing for Amazon because I've got this first look deal and he's, he's working with Amazon on that. He's producing that show, so he's on the ground over there right now. Um, and I kind of had a few questions for him to begin with. It was like, so, and then I was like, you know what, I don't need to know anymore. Uh, it's not obviously, it's not a remake. Um, so it's actually not based on the fellowship or any of that. So, so I think it could be really, really interesting from that perspective. Cause I think it's hard, you know, I remember being on set with Peter and him saying, can you imagine the day when they do a remake of this movie? And I was like, That's <laughs> and then of course here we are 20 years later, but it's not a remake. Um, and the Lord of the Rings is a title for a world but i think it's going to be interesting from that perspective because i think if it was a remake i'd be like well it's hard to we've seen you're going to take us back into hobbiton and and try and tell us that what we saw you know it was so you know it was such an art you know it was such a informative time and it was had such an impact so it's different you know what i mean um did that what, what's going to be out what's coming i think and i think that's a good thing i think it's going to be interesting and i'm, I'm yeah okay. I'm, going to, I'm going to fan it up for sure fan yeah. it on <laughs> streaming wow you know what i mean I, I, listen as a huge fan of what peter did with the lord of the rings trilogy i would burn the shit to the ground if they tried to remake this stuff i'm happy that they're exploring the world as long as it's yeah. and, and that's what they're doing it's yeah exactly they're not idiots and i mean look i think i think Jeff Bezos is a big fan of the fantasy world, which is great. Um, that's my understanding, you know. Um, and, you know, I mean, they certainly paid a pretty penny to get it done, so to get the rights to do that. So there's a lot of, 
I'm no doubt there's a lot riding there um, on, on, on that. Um, you know, I mean, we, you know, Carnival Row is a, is a show that I'm doing for Amazon right now. And that's a fantasy epic noir detective drama kind of thing. And it's, it's been a great experience for me. I, I literally was going to bring that up with you if you didn't mind. Um, sure. one, one of the things I love about shows that are eight episodes is they always leave you wanting more. It's like, it's just a really great length. Did you know yeah. when you were signing on that the seasons would be eight episodes? You know, when I signed on, to be honest, it was, I was signing on to an idea and a premise and I felt that, you know, it, it was, I, I like, I, I loved the idea of this character, Rycroft. I thought there was, there was, there was, from what I was being described, there was a lot that could kind of, that I could kind of like mine to keep my, my creative juices flowing for eight hours, which is basically what it is. It was like an eight hour movie, you know, really. I mean, I, I, like it was, it was a, it's a big set and a big world and there is no shortcuts and it's, it's like, it's hitting pretty heavy. You know, anyone who comes to that set is like, uh, and I've, and I've been on some pretty big sets, so I know what they look like as well. And they're not, they're not, they're not messing around, as it say. Um, and it was, and it was, and I, and I would say, you know, yeah, eight, eight, eight is a good number. I think for the second season, because we got sort of, we got truncated a little bit, we got pulled out because of COVID. I was like three weeks from finishing the season, but, um, I, I just actually, we, I think what we're going to, they're going to do is release the first half. So I think they might add an episode. So they'll release six and six, maybe something like that or eight, hang on, eight, nine, 10, maybe, maybe they'll do five and five. I'm sorry. I think they'll do five and five, I can't, but they're, they're going to basically add one, I think, or they'll do five and four, but they wanted to, I think they'll release to keep the, to keep the momentum of the show moving forward, which I think it's, is necessary for audiences to stay engaged and entertained but the first season was hard man it was it wasn't um you know it, a world building like that i think you know it's true for many shows you know we went back and sh we shot in the same way that game of thrones did and it was weird because we were being compared at the first when we when we did it like oh we're trying to be game of thrones and it's nothing like game of thrones it's a completely different um it's just because it's a fantasy and it's a big big show but it wasn't you know, it's a totally different world building, but, but as, but similarly to, to get, just as I say that similarly to Game of Thrones, we went back and reshot some of the first, um, some of that first season because we needed to, to, to clarify what was happening. And I think that's true of, of some of those big world building shows, you know, and then once you've got, once you're set, you're off to the races and I'm excited about season two, we've got Eric, um, this, uh, Eric Olsen, the showrunner who came in and he did a great job with Daredevil. Exactly. He came in and he knocked it out of the park and he's, he's really brave. Um, he's really, he's really courageous with his storytelling and his ideas and he's not afraid to go to bat for some big ideas and risk, take some risks. And I think, and for me, I was like, look, you know, if we're not taking huge risks in this medium, I don't want to do it, you know? And um, so like, I think, you know, there's some, some cool stuff to come for the season two and it gets bigger. And it was also, you know, in a way it was a bit sort of strategic because I, you know, I've, I've had a kid and I, and I, I was, I've got a nine year old now, but it was like, in a way I was, you know, if you think I was so visible for so many years in my twenties and it's hard to keep track of what I was doing and when I was doing it. Right. But like, I kind of had a, had a breather and this was kind of a cool way to come back into people's consciousness with something that I would say probably the majority of my audience likes to see me in is, is a, fantasy period kind of epic drama thing. One of the things that I found about talking to people who've worked on television, the first season is often figuring out how to make something in the time period with the budget you have, learning the characters, building the sets, whatever. The second season is where you take everything you learn from the first season and sort of do it again, but you've learned yeah. so much. So what did you guys learn making the first season that you wanted to take with you to the second season? Um, that's a good question. I would say, you know, the world of Carnival Row, the characters, the, uh, the races, uh, the class, uh, disparity in class race. It just, it was, it was, it was, it was very, um, all 
shot through this fantasy lens, you could sort of look at all of these, you could comment and look at a lot of what, what's happening today, you know, with Black Lives Matters and, you know, all of these movements that were so, are so necessary and important for us to move forward as a society. They were, we were looking, we could look at them through this fantasy lens in, 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 in Carnival and we did. And, and, uh, and I think there was, there was some interesting things that we thought, you know, we can do moving forward, you know, to take that even further, I would say, and in some respects, and but also keep the suspension and and storytelling on point with the sort of noir detective drama thriller that we've we're presenting as well, you know. But um, but staying true to the world of Carnival Row and what those creatures in Carnival Row, those races of, of creatures, what they they mean and represent and stuff. One of the things that I found with every additional season is you get to build one new set. So uh, did you get to build some new cool set for season two? Yeah. yeah Can you tease it? <laughs> Can I tease it? Yeah. I'll, I'll say this. Um, we, we, so uh, can't, the, the row is expanded. In any, in, in any event, right? Because if you imagine where we ended the season one behind a wall, so now all these different races are, 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 are in this boiling pot of Carnival Row. So this, it's, a, it's evolved, it's changed, it's grown, it's adapted, and it, and it looks phenomenal. But then um, there is a couple of storylines that we're actually going to shoot in um, on location uh, in another part of Europe, which COVID prevented they were all about to go and film in Croatia um, everything was set and it was just like COVID just killed that so actually what I think is going to be even more interesting is what they're doing now is they've just taken over another giant part of the studio to build out this other world which was going to be as I said a Croatia location and it's I think it's going to be even more interesting because it's with the amount of space they've got to build out these worlds and, and, and the talent uh, of, of people who are working on building the worlds out, it's, it's, it's sort of, you know, it's really rich. So yeah. we were lucky to go back and polish off a little bit. I managed to get in and out and get some stuff done so that we can close out that first half of the second season, which I think will tease people into wanting more, which is good. Listen, I know you have to go. I just want to say a sincere thank you for giving you. so much time. Uh, and congrats on, you know, retaliation and everything that's going on. And, um, you know, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, man. And I, I'm, I'm glad I got to speak to you. Um, yeah, hopefully this was not too painful. No, it was actually really, really enjoyable. Thank you for um, the sincerity of the questions and, uh, and being interested. Actually, one last thing, if you don't mind. I've always wanted to know. Did you learn in acting school how to not blink? Or is that something that you've picked up along the way? Because I'm fascinated by watching actors. I think I picked it up along the way. You definitely don't learn it. But it's one of those things where when you're standing on set and it's like, and you've got wind blowing in your eyes and snow and whatever, sand and whatever else. But yeah, that's funny. Yeah, I've, I've noticed it with like a great performance. People never blink. That's They're it. just eyes open. You know, yeah. Don't miss a minute. Don't miss a second. Not a blink of an eye. Please, mate. Thank you very much. Bless you.